Hello, everybody. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, present uh, a recent work that we did um, with uh, a few other collaborators, uh, specifically Jan Lee from Universal uh, Massachusetts, Nagaraj Rao, uh, he's, uh, he brought a question to me, and Feng Gao from Maryland, and uh, uh, we also have a, a, a VNN uh, contact from their government who collected our data set. So it's an interesting story that I want to share. So um, about half a year ago, I got an email from Nagaraj uh, from Asian Development Bank. He told me that, uh, Caillou, I read a few papers of yours. It seems that you uh, can really do something using remote sensing for crops. And, and I said, yes. And he asked, uh, do you mind to do something for us? I said, sure. Well, what, what, will be, uh, what would it be about? And then he said, we have, uh, we have collected a lot of feel good, a lot of a good field level data set um, and uh, uh, thousands of them and uh, however we don't have funding to do that. Um, I was very confused uh, but I said okay if you have great data set I will still go for that. So uh, essentially this is what happened. Uh, so we built this product uh, uh, and, uh, and the paper for them without uh, um, much funding from them but uh, they provide us great data set. So the first message I want to carry is that if we want to really start to do uh, using remote sensing to do very field level crop production um, estimation, I think uh, the data set is very, very critical. So this is the, actually the first message. I will talk about the work from these four aspects, objective, give some background, methodology, and then conclude my work. And uh, there is actually some discussion about the future work. Um, so first of all, I, uh, the, the motivation here is we really want to identify where are the crop fields. Um, uh, that grow paddy rice and uh, estimate the crop yield. The, the, the rationale here is that uh, the standard way of doing that is people go to the field and collect, cuts the field, cuts the field uh, crop and, and the way that and then collect and so it's very labor intensive, very costly and uh, so we come up, so it's, it's very natural that we can, we should try to use satellite. However, the challenge of using satellite, especially in tropical regions, and we are not talking about Cerrado and Savannas, uh, which I did some lot of research work in my PhD that looking at savannas and cerrados in Africa uh, and and Brazil. But we are looking at the tropical for uh, tropical regions that has a lot of rainfall, a lot of clouds, and this pose a great challenge of using remote sensing because mostly we are rely on optical remote sensing, which means that it's essentially camera. You know, some bands go beyond the visible band, near infrared, but it's essentially camera. If you have a cloud, which is uh, pervasive in the tropical regions, you basically don't get an image. And so we have a, a very big challenge of how to use the satellite in those situations. And so um, that basically essentially the major task that we want to overcome. And this is also one of the second, uh, second message I want to carry. But uh, before I go that, this is the study area we look at. We look at uh, VNN. And so VNN uh, as a country that produce rank number four uh, in terms of uh, in terms of produ uh, producing the paddy rice uh, worldwide, and so we actually looking at there are two major regions in in Vienna that produce corn, uh, produce paddy rice. The first region is actually the Mekong region. This is the Delta region here, and the other region is the Taiping region. And so we are looking at the Taiping region. And if you ask me why, and this is where the data set collected. Um, and so a lot of backgrounds, I think uh, people start to do remote sensing for, uh, for crop uh, prediction, crop yield prediction for ages. However, I think there's great challenges here. And uh, so if we use visible band and the near infrared, we always have the cloudy issues that we just don't get good image. And uh, if we're using radar, there is a possibility, and actually we'll discuss that in this work, because we have a very valuable data set from JAXA, which is the Counterparts in Japan um, of the NASA, um, so we have the JAXA data of the ALOS 2 data set, which is the L-band radar data. So we are actually also use that data set in our study. Um, there are a few uh, things that I summarized. So first of all, usually in, in these studies, we lack of field level data set to really do the estimation and train the algorithm. We lack of the satellite data set because primarily because of the cloudy issues and. Uh, and, and uh, so we have to tackle that questions. So this is why um, I guess very excited about this study. And so be more specific, here are the two challenges. So we believe that if we want to go to the field level to estimate the crop yield and, uh, and know the crop type, we really need to have the high spatial and the temporal resolution together. This means that the field spatial resolution, we need to go to the field. 
field level, which means 10 meters or 20 meters or 30 meters, but definitely not 250 meters like modest pixel. Um, and this is mostly because the system, the system there is the, the small holder farmer system. And so it's not like a Brazil or, or here um, that we have big farms. And at the same time, we really need high frequency of image. And the reason of, uh, of, of having that is if you really want to start to understand crop growth condition, uh, if you want to start to predict the crop yield, we need that information. And, uh, and also, I think Stephanie's study um, uh, that uh, she mentioned previously also used the time series data set to identify different crop types. So in other words, that temporal, spatial, uh, temporal resolution and spatial resolution both needs to be high in this specific case. Now, what do we do? Um, this is another graph showing the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution, and these are the different bubbles uh, representing the different applications. So we see that if we want to know the crop type and the yield estimation, we at least need to go below 100 meters and go down to at least the below uh, uh, monthly temporal re uh, revisiting uh, frequency. Um, so the approach that we come up with, this is, a, this is an approach that we tested, is primarily using the existing data set. Um, but we find a way to fuse these data. So specifically, what we, what we did is we have this Landsat data, which is at 30 meter resolution, but it's every 16-day six, revisiting frequency. And usually when they pass over you know, the growing season, you usually get a cloudy day. So th this image may have a lot of clouds. Um, however, we also have this modest data. Uh, previous speakers already mentioned. The modest data actually have two overpass every day from Terra and Aqua. Um, and their spatial resolution is relatively coarse. So it's about 500 meters primarily. The, the ideal here is very simple. We want to leverage both data sets that one has a very high spatial resolution and the other has very high frequency uh, in time. So we use some um, um, advanced machine learning algorithm to bring the data set together. Essentially, what we did is we tried to optimize the information contents. And so we generate a product that covers the whole growing season. Um, and have the everyday image um, through the fusing, uh, through this fusion algorithm, and, and uh, so this is essentially what we did is we we find the image that is clean in Landsat, and then we fuse this image. Now, what essentially we did is we specifically look at this image at, for, as an example, and this is NDVI. The x-axis is the time of the year, um, and so if we only focus on the original Landsat data. We will only see these circled, the dark circled uh, um, points. So it's very sparse for that specific pixel. But if we leverage the Landsat and the MODIS data together and they produce our few fusion data set, we actually dramatically increase the data points over the growing season. And this is one way that we try to tackle these problems of the scarcity of data sets in the tropical forest. And so because we have this approach, we implement to the whole uh, domain of study domain. So we have uh, the time series of 30 meter resolution every day cover the whole study area. Um, and so then the next challenge that we're facing is how to do the crop yield. Now this is what we really uh, people see and is satellite see. This is the, the, the crop. But what we really care about is this grain. So there's a big gap from here to here. And uh, so, um, but this is the argument goal. This is our interest. So if we study to, if we talk about a little bit of plant physiology, essentially crop has the two stages. One stage is the vegetative stage, one is the reproductive stage. Well, the vegetative stage crop grow their leaves, grow their height, and so the satellite can easily see that. However, if, once you the crop reach to the reproductive stage, the crop aerial, uh, a crop leaf aerial, and the height re almost reach the plateau. It's the grain that start to form and start to expand their grain weight and size. So this is very encouraging. Uh, this is very challenging to model this part of the process because some of them are above canopy, but a lot of them are actually below canopy. So what I claim is that the vegetative stage, which is here, is can be observed by satellite, but the reproductive stage actually not. To give you another idea, the x-axis is the time, the y-axis, uh, the green one refers to LAI, and, uh, and the, the brown one refers to yield. So we have the vegetative stage and the reproductive stage. But during the reproductive stage, it's primarily the grain increase your yield. But it's uh, not really observed or very challenging to be observed by the satellite. So what we need to do is we have the above-ground biomass, which can be observed from the satellite. 
uh, as approximation of the linear row index, but at the same time, there's the harvest index term, which uh, needs to characterize to capture the variabilities happen during the flower and the grain filling stage, which is the reproductive stage, which, which is the period that we kill most. And so uh, this part is, uh, can be seen by satellite, but this part couldn't, uh, primarily couldn't. And so we need to do some modelings. Um, so what we did in this specific study is that we first fused the data set of Landsat and MODIS, and then we start to identify the crop types, and finally we do the crop yield forecasting um, estimation. So we actually use tons of satellite data set from both Landsat 7 and 8 for the specific yield, which is the second growing season of, um, of 2015 in Lanan. And then we use a bunch of uh, the MODIS data set. So the idea is to fuse these two data sets together. And, uh, Give you an example. This is another example that we show. This is the this is the study area. So uh, this is a, a relatively uh, um, poor performance of the time series, but we get a better one in the second version. So this is the first version that we got. So essentially, the x-axis is the time, the y-axis is the fused data set. So we will see that we get these a uh, lot of lot of points during the two growing season, and this is the very typical double growing season deal. People grow uh, actually two seasons of paddy rice in this specific uh, region. So what we did is we have this fusion, and then we uh, use uh, algorithm to extrapolate to the daily scales. And another example that we see is that if you look at some spatial scales, you will see that the green color, uh, in this specific case, is the NDVI, means uh, the greener color means that NDVI is high, the brown color means it's uh, lower. So we actually start to see that this corresponding to different time period, we actually see that it's very green and start to become brown, and then green again. And so we use this data set and we use random forest to uh, identify the different crop types. And uh, I tend to see that identify crop types is, uh, is uh, uh, relatively straightforward in our case because we do have a lot of data set. And for the crop data accuracy, we can reach pretty high, 90% 90, uh, 90 accuracy in this specific case. And, and you will also see that we use Alos data to do the similar thing. So we actually use different categories. The best category is actually using the time series of the NDVI data set. And the specific for crop, which is the, or, uh, the, the this red color, is that we have a pretty high performance. And then using all of data actually have lower performance. This is the radar data that we also use. So, uh, so it seems that the all of data are not really helping. Um, these are the sites that we do, not we, the, 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 the Asian Development Bank and the Venezuelan government um, did these uh, extensive surveys at these locations for multiple sites at each of these locations. So we use actually this data set to do our uh, estimation. Now, uh, we, uh, this is the way that we look at. We look at the peak time uh, of the growing season that we can extract the time series of uh, um, uh, the, the, the peak of the LAR. And then we also uh, include the sum of the sowing date and the, the, the growth rate of these time series and the senescence rate of these time series into the uh, into our growth model. So this is a this is a model that uh, we try to leverage the different information from these time series. And uh, the results that we show here is we actually use different time uh, vegetation index and DVI, EVI, and the GCVI. Those are representing different vegetation index that are commonly used. We actually find the NDVI actually best performed. The OSCO is about 0.4. Um, but the, what's uh, very encouraging is that these are actually the different crop variety. If we only look at the dominant variety, which is the BC15, uh, you know, about 50% of the people actually grow this type. Just looking at that specific type, we actually reach the R square of about 0.7. So, uh, so variety information is very, very critical in terms of crop yield estimation. We we extrapolate our algorithm to the space, and uh, this is the comparison of our results and uh, the statistical results as well as the state level uh, uh, survey. So our results is very encouraging. We are winning the bounds and the accuracy, the, the accuracy and the common errors that we, uh, uh, our approach is about 10%. So let me conclude. I think uh, a few messages that, uh, that I want to talk about here. The first of all, I think if we really want to extrapolate to other regions, we really need to uh, need very good data set at the field level for the crop type. And uh, if you want to, you know, it, it, this is extremely important because in the future, if you don't want to collect these data set, you have to first collect them for the study. And, and then, you know, with the hope that in the future, our algorithm is advanced enough so you don't really need to go to the field and cut. And the second part is that the, the fusion of uh, this approach that we combine that set and modest. Actually, our new algorithm actually includes the Sentinel-2 data set, which 
means that we bring the data set to 10 meter resolution. So we can e even go to Africa for these very small order farmers. And uh, last but not least, I think uh, we talk about the satellite mapping and the yield. I think yield still has a lot of challenge. Mapping is relatively straightforward and our technology is more or less uh, uh, matured. And, and so I think uh, uh, the radar data is actually not really helping too much. Uh, we actually look at the, uh, the radar data performance and the yield is very bad. Um, and primarily because some other reasons, it, it's really band sensitive. Um, and also, I think, uh, let me conclude here, is uh, uh, my lab is doing a lot of work and we have a heavy focus in the US, uh, specifically the Corn Belt. We set up field level uh, network and the scale up to the space using the satellite. And we are also building, you know, I think one of the most advanced the problem model uh, that's incorporated into the NCOM model. So, um, and the, the motivation for me is really to monitor global food production. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So the question is, you are, you are thinking that incorporating the climate variables into the quantification of the harvest index. That's essentially what we did. I just don't have enough time to elaborate that part. So you have to use, because we couldn't observe that by satellite, we have to model that. And uh, there is a lot of agronomy knowledge already there, so we use a lot of them and the calibrate using historical data. 